Brilliant. So orthotics. So let's start a little bit little bit with general biomechanics so often you hear the words kinetics and kinematics flying around um, and really the easiest way to put it down to uh, the easiest way to kind of explain it is for kinematics is the branch of mechanics which describes the motion of objects um, and kinetics describes the forces which make that movement so kinematics you can you can see, you can see what what something looks like. Whereas kinetics, you might not be able to see. It's going to be those internal forces, what what the forces are within the muscles to make the movement. And what you see with the movement is your your kinematics. Um, and what we try to do with orthotics is we try to alter the location, vector, and timing of these forces at the foot orthosis interface. Um, and we want to alter the kinetics. So how do we do that? We look at surface geometry, so the contours of the orthotic, um, the load deformation characteristics, um, and the the materials, so that's like the materials used, and then the functional characteristics, so your um, your modifications that you're putting on on that orthotic. And I've just put a little bit at the bottom. So we want to we want to set expectations for patients. So everybody's seen that that classic um, photo of. Uh, somebody standing on the ground um, and they're they're in a, a pronated position uh, and then suddenly you put them on a pair of insoles or orthotics and they are magically in that that neutral position that uh, that everyone talks about so we we aren't necessarily trying to change the kinematics so what we can see so where you can see the difference between pronation and a neutral position when they're standing on orthotic that's the kinematics what we want to change is the kinetics so what's going on with the loads and the forces uh, in in the foot so Lots of people can probably relate when they've had a patient and they've come back in for review and their their symptoms are are, are great. They're, they've uh, their their symptoms have all resolved. And you have a look at them walking up and down with their orthotics, um, and you can still see them pronating heavily, or you can still see them very supinated. Um, and you think, oh gosh, um, I'm not sure I've done anything there because you, you can't see it. Um, and lots of especially with children and parents um, the 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 child will be doing great symptom wise but the the mother will look and say oh well the my child is still walking in a pronated position the arch is still flattening so you're setting the expectation that you are altering what's going on internally you're altering the kinetics and it might be that you don't see anything that happens externally so you might not see kinematics change so that's just some expectations that you want to yeah, talk to your patients about. So clinical testing. The purpose of the assessment is to determine the pathomechanics uh, contributing to the, the presenting complaint so that a treatment can be formulated. Um, if we test or measure something, is it going to change our diagnosis or prescription? So obviously, with um, uh, biomechanics assessments, there are a whole host of different assessments that you can do. And if you were to run through all of them with every single patient, you will be there for at least 24 hours. Um, so usually what you're doing is you're with your subjective, you're able to narrow down a bit about which which kind of assessment techniques you're going to be doing within that session. Um, and then what what I'm going to be doing in this presentation is just to simplify that further and just to pick a couple of the ones that actually might have an influence on, on your orthotic prescription. So I've just put it at the bottom here, if, if orthoses form part of your treatment plan, there are a number of tests that can help you to establish what your patient will tolerate um, and respond to in terms of an orthosis. So I've just picked, picked a select through a few sorry, that can help aid with the decision making of your orthotics. So just a bit of a disclaimer, I'm not telling you what you should and shouldn't do. It's, it's just a bit of food for thought and hopefully some takeaways that you, you can possibly use in your clinics. OK. 
So, foot posture index to start with. So this is your, your diagnostic tool for, for scaling how pronated or supinated a patient is in, in a relaxing stance position. So you can see you've got um, six different um, components that you're measuring and it, take note that they are all in different planes, um, which is good. It means that we are assessing in all the different planes because there are lots of assessments that will only will only assess in, in say one plane and they don't take other planes into consideration. So um, this is good. And so what you're doing is you're measuring these and you're putting in a score in these boxes. And then at the end, you'll be given a score, uh, an overall score for that patient. And it is meant to tell you how supinated or pronated a patient is. So if we run through it quickly. So the first one is tailor head location or palpation. So you are palpating with your fingers uh, around the tailor, tailor's head. And if you can feel kind of equal or you're equally um, palpable on the lateral and medial side of the tailor head, then you're going to score that person a zero. If you feel slightly palpable on the lateral side, um, but more palpable on the medial side, then you're going to go up to a one. And then at the the other end of the spectrum you've got um, you, you're not going to be palpating it much on the lateral side but you will feel it must much more prominent on the medial side and then vice versa um, when you go down to the minus side you'll be palpating it on the lateral side not on the medial side so when you're going down to the uh, yeah the, when the minus side you'll be palpating it um, and then if we move on to curves above and below the lateral malleoli. Um, so just as, as, as well, the more plus you get, uh, the more pronated someone is and the more minus you get, the more supinated. So you're looking here where these red lines are at the curves uh, above and below the, the malleoli on the lateral side. So you can see when a, when a foot is more pronated or more plus, um, the curves are uh, the curve below the malleolus is more marked concave um, and then on your supinated side it's more convex um, at the, below the malleoli. Eversion and inversion of the calcaneus. So here you just you're looking at yeah what whether the calcaneus is, is leaning in or out. Uh, and if it's vertical, you've got a score of zero. Um, and for a pronated foot, you're going to be looking at a one or a two, uh, of which will be uh, more valgus. And then for the minus, more varus. And then bold in the region of the tailor navicular joint. So here where the circle is, is where you're looking. Um, at a zero, you've got the area is, is just pretty flat. Um, and then for if you're going up towards pronation, you're going to start to see more of a bulging. So you see more of a, a uh, convex bulge here. Whereas in a supinated foot, you see this divot or a dimple. Um, that's what you would, yeah, you would score more minus for that. Then the congruence of the medial longitudinal arch. So here where the red lines are is where you're looking at the arch. So for that neutral foot, um, for a zero, the arch is sort of normal and a concentric alley curve. So uh, the curve is, um, yeah, it's pretty central. And then for a more pronated foot, you're looking at, here we go, where it's, it's more, it's much more flat. And then for your supinated foot, so the arch is it's a high arch and acutely angled more towards the posterior end of the medial arch. So just at the back, uh, posteriorly here, um, it's much more acute angle. And then adduction and abduction of the forefoot on the rear foot. So this is your too many toes sign. So for neutral, um, median lateral toes, you'll see kind of equally visible. Um, whereas for a more pronated, you're going to see more of the toes laterally. Um, more supinated, you'll see more of the toes uh, medially. 
So here is what, um, when you put it on the spectrum, so normal, you're looking at kind of plus one to plus five. Pronated, you're looking plus six to plus nine. Um, and highly pronated, you've got your plus 10. Uh, for your supinated, minus one to minus four, and highly supinated, anything above minus five. And so here, the more minus, the more supinated, the more plus, the more pronated. It's good because it gives you a numerical score, so you've got some quantitative data. Um, and is it reliable and repeatable? Yes, it is. So it's really good for for clinicians who you can you can write something down, um, and then if you wanted to come and and reassess that patient later down the line, if if you're seeing them a couple of months or a couple of years down the line, you you kind of know what what they were like when they first came in. You can note any changes that might have happened. But it's also good for um, if there's going to be a new clinician seeing that patient. So they have they they have a bit of an idea of, of what kind of a foot type is coming in. And as I said at the beginning, it's good because it makes you look at all the, the planes of motion. So um, in a way, it can be more superior to the ones that only look at um, that single plane of motion. Um, so things like your calcaneals. Uh, stance position. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, in the neutral and uh, relaxed calcaneal stance position. So, points to consider though is it is a static assessment. So, whether that static assessment, whether it, it things can change when you start to to add movement and make it come become dynamic. So that's just something to consider. And here we are looking very much at kinematics. So we're, we're, we're looking at what we can see. Um, so that kind of relates to root theory. Um, if we're looking at that kind of, whether it's that neutral foot and anything that deviates away from that neutral foot um, is then considered to, to, be, to be bad. Um, and we've got to intervene, obviously, Biomechanics has come a long way from there, um, and there are lots of other theories that uh, have built upon root theory. Um, so, it, as it is, it is a good assessment to have as part of your, your portfolio, but it's it's not something that you can rely on solely for for prescribing. Um, and so here, this kind of statement is 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 very root and, and kinematic. So that that classic picture of the standing on orthotics, if it rolls in, roll it out. The more it rolls in, the more you roll it out and vice versa. So that's, you wouldn't want to rely on that solely. Um, you, you, there are lots of other things that will come into play with that as if they were looking more at kinetic you know, of what happens within the, within the structures. It has been associated with um, patellofemoral pain um, uh, and the risk of foot and ankle overuse injuries in football uh, and then medial knee osteoarthritis as well, which I'm going to touch upon a little bit more. So what they found in this paper was that um, the, the more pronated a patient was, um, the, the, sorry, the, the cases of mesial knee osteoarthritis, they found they had a, a more pronated foot posture. So if we look here, what we see with um, medial knee osteoarthritis um, is obviously it happens within this point here. Um, and so papers suggest that actually the medial knee OA is usually found in that genu verum, so when the knee actually is going outwards, not inwards, as you see here with a pronated foot type. And that's because if the if the knee is going, if we go with this one, so if it going if it's going inwards, the medial compartment of the knee actually opens up um, as the as the foot pronates. So if the foot was if the knee was um, in a a verum position, so going outwards, then it's going to be the medial side that compresses, and that's what gives you that medial partment OA. So the question here really is whether the foot ab abnormally influences um, 
So yeah, if, if somebody's got uh, compress uh, or pain in the medial knee because of medial knee uh, OA, you're, you're going to want to subconsciously take away that um, compressive force. And the way to do that is actually to pronate that foot. So if you're pronating the foot, it moves the knee towards the midline and opens up that medial compartment of the knee. So as it says here, whether whether this is, if you see a patient come in and they've got medial knee away and you see that they're pronating, that actually might, they might be doing that to try and offload that area. So you putting in an orthotic that's going to try and counter out, counteract that um, might actually make things worse. So yeah, that is something else to, to consider with, with medial knee OA. Right, then move on to subtalar joint axis location. So um, this allows you to determine the position of the subtalar joint axis. And this is important clinically because the moments of the muscle forces and the ground reaction force are dependent upon the location of the joint axis. So here you can see is a normal joint uh, subtalar joint axis location kind of comes between or at the first or between the first and second, wherever if it's medially, um, it's coming out right over the, uh, the medial side of the foot and laterally uh, more towards the lateral side of the foot. Um, actually, I'll just go back one. So the reason that uh, your medially deviated subtalar joint axis is associated with your pronated foot and your laterally deviated subtalar joint axis is uh, associated with your lateral, uh, your supinated foot type is because if we take the neutral, for example, we've got kind of a similar amount of, of surface area under the foot that's going to be the, um, counteracting each other. So everything over the lateral side of the foot um, is going to try and pronate that patient. And everything over the medial side of that axis is going to try and supinate that patient. And because with the normal uh, axis, uh, you've got a similar amount of um, area both sides it will by default kind of stay in that neutral position whereas if we moved over to the medially deviated subtalar joint axis there is way more of that foot area here that's going to be trying to that's causing that um, pronation moment um, than that little bit over the medial side that's causing a supination moment so um, by default uh, it pronates the foot and then Obviously, um, the opposite happens on the laterally deviated subtalar joint axis. So how we're doing this, um, you can do it with the patient supine or prone, um, whichever you feel more comfortable doing or however uh, more comfortable the patient feels. You put light dorsiflexion force on the fifth metatarsal. Um, fifth metatarsal head, um, and then you use your thumb to work across the the rear foot. So you you will be pushing. If you push on the medial side of the heel, for instance, you are going to be supinating that foot. Um, and then if you're pushing over the lateral side of the heel, you will be pronating that foot. And you work along the foot until you reach a point that the foot doesn't neither pronates or supinates and you mark an X and then you move further up the foot and again the more medial you go the more you should see a, a supinatory uh, a, a supination um, position of the foot and the more lateral you go the more pronated you'll see the foot and you work along again until you find where it no uh, it neither pronates or supinates and you mark across and you can do that all the way up to the forefoot area and you join those marks together so for instance here um, just tested three different sites join them up and you get your subtalar joint axis so this one you can see is, is slightly medially deviated so here, as I was saying um, on the first slide, um, on the subtalar joint axis location, the more medial the axis, the greater the magnitude of pronation moment because you've got a whole lot of foot here that's going to be acting to pronate that foot. Um, 
whereas if it's a more normal axis you've got more equal magnitudes of pronation and supination and then the more lateral you've got the greater magnitude of supination moment. So this test doesn't predict, it can't predict pathology, but that more medial axis is associated with the highly pronated foot and then the more lateral is more associated with your supinated foot. And why this is good to know for orthotic therapy is, oh, I'm going down the wrong way, is because anything you put on the lateral side um, of the orthotic or lateral side of the supinate uh subtotal joint axis location where the orthotic is is going to pronate that foot and anything over that medial side will supinate that foot so for instance if you are looking at putting four foot um varus or valgus correction um, if you were putting it on a medially deviated subtotal joint axis even if you put a medial wedge or a varus wedge um, on a patient with medially deviated subtalar joint axis, you are likely, well, you're going to further pronate that patient. So it's not going to help you um, get a supination moment. So what you're going to want to do if there's a, a more uh, medially deviated one is uh, subtalar joint axis is you're going to do sort of more aggressive rear foot posting with your Kirby skives, Mo's eyes, um, because for instance you've only got this little bit of of area here that you're going to be able to to supinate that that pronated patient. So you're sorry for jumping around the slides. Um, so here your Kirby skives they are positioned right on that medial portion. Um, and same with your Mohs eyes, so they will go, your Mohs eyes just go to exactly as your subtalar joint axis position. So for your Mohs eyes, you're going to want, you'd need to send the lab the position of the um, subtalar joint axis location. So if you're casting, if you've drawn on that foot uh, where the axis is, if you're casting, it will come out on that, um, on that cast. If you're foam boxing, you can either kind of eyeball it and draw it on the foam box or you can uh, I've had uh, I've been able to do it with putting like a lipstick on the patient's foot and standing them on the the foam box that normally comes off in the foam box um, and if you're scanning you just send in uh, send in a photo and well, on the scan it will come up um, so yeah you're looking at more of your skives mosaic posts hemi posts as well that can be all of these can be medial or lateral, so it's not only for your, your pronated patients. If you've got a supinated patient that's got a laterally deviated subtalar joint axis, put it on the lateral side, it will give you a, a greater um, pronation moment. So from your off-the-shelf devices, uh, your, your bio range, you've got your bio skive, so that incorporates your, your Kirby skive there, it's that increased inclination angle. Um, note that these ones only come on the medial side, so you wouldn't be able to use this one for a, uh, a supinated foot type um, that you wanted to pronate. Um, bio Unified and Biomex, they can be used for, for either your um, pronated or supinated patients so they'll come with rear foot wedges that you're able to to pop on medial or laterally um, and then up here is a little bit about the EVAs so obviously you can have a greater density on the the lateral side or the medial side um, so it will give a, a greater force and supination resistance so this is to determine the extent of the supination resistance force or how hard it is to supinate that foot. And that tells you how much force you are likely to need to, um, to match this through an orthotic device. So in a relaxed stance position, the examiner will use the middle fingers to pull upwards on the plantar medial um, navicular. And you're kind of feeling, yeah, for how much force is required to initiate supination. Um, so you, for a high supination resistance force, it's going to be really, really hard to get that foot into supination. Whereas if it's really easy to, to throw them over, you've got um, 
uh, a lower supination resistance force. Um, and something here to note is actually the, the body weight only plays a part of that um, supination resistance. So just because you have a, a, a heavy bloke doesn't mean to say that their supination resistance is, is going to be really high. Um, I've had kids that uh, have really, really high supination resistance, much higher than um, some of my uh, heavy males. Um, so yeah, just just to be wary, it only plays a, a part, um, and the other pa another part of it can be to do with the subtalar joint axis location. So you can see here that um, the correlation it correlates highly with subtalar joint axis position, and that's to do with the lever arms. So apologies, I'm going to jump back up here. So for instance. You're going to have a higher supination resistance force if you've got a medially deviated subtalar joint axis. And that's because your lever arm is very, very small, or very, very short, sorry. Um, so you're going to need a lot more force to get that foot into supination. Whereas when you've got a laterally deviated subtalar joint axis, that lever arm is much longer. So it's a lot easier to, to put that foot into supination. So if you have a, a, a very heavy male with a laterally deviated subtalar joint axis, you're going to be ve it's very easy to, to move them into a, a, a supinated um, position. The so possible outcomes that you might want to consider if there's a low supination resistance, you you aren't um, you're not going to need so much of a a high density uh, along the medial side for instance you, you might want there to be more or stiffer on the lateral side especially if it's yeah if it's very very low they might um, they're going to need some lateral wedging um, and a stiffer lateral side um, whereas if it's a high supination resistance you're going to want the the wedging on the the medial side to try and uh, you need more force to get it into that supination, so you're going to want a stiffer device, um, medial skive and, and medial posting. And here is um, a little bit about the materials that you can use in your custom devices. So your level of control is, is kind of your stiffness, really, that you can get from a an orthotic um, so if these were all, say, medium density, medium um, or semi-flexible uh, polyprop or, or carbon, if they were all on that kind of middle range, this is kind of how they would sit on that level of control. So your simple insoles, they're your ones that you, you kind of, you can see in boots all the time. Um, if they're, yeah, just made of kind of a poron and they're very flexible and, and flimsy, uh, EVA is kind of set at a three, and then you go up through the plastic, the poly, polyprop, polyethylene, and then at the highest level of control, you've got your carbon fibre. So they're going to give you the greatest level of control, but also give you the thinnest device. So you could use, say, a high density EVA, and it might match um, a, a slightly more flexible carbon fibre. Um, but the difference in bulk of these two would be would be massive. So to have a, um, yeah, your EVA is going to be much more bulky than, say, your carbon fibre. You can get the same level of control um, with these ones as you can with the EVA without increasing the, the bulk of it too much. So your Bio Advanced, Biomex, and Bio Unified, they've all got um, different densities um, and obviously that box of components that you can put medial laterally. Um, if you've got somebody with a really low supination resistance, supination resistance force, they're, they're likely that they tell you that they get ankle, lateral ankle sprains all the time. So you might want to consider something like a lateral flange just to stabilise that um, that lateral bit of the foot. So Jack and Hubshire. So this is your windlass mechanism. So what your windlass is. It, is designed to do is it, it supports the medial and lateral longitudinal arch. Um, it can it assists in that resupination of the subtalar joint um, during propulsion. Um, 
assist in the posterior compartment uh, of muscles by limiting the subtalar joint pronation and prevents longitudinal arch flattening um, and this reduces the tensile forces within the plantar ligaments um, and prevents that excessive interosseous, interosseous compressive forces on the dorsal aspect of the midfoot so we we want this wind last mechanism to work through through gait so how you do it is you just get your patient in weight bearing relaxed stance um, and you attempt to dorsiflex the the big toe and it will be scored a zero if you can't lift the big toe off the ground and a one if you can um if you can just lift the big toe but nothing else happens and then a two if you lift the big toe and the arch starts to rise and then three um, if you lift the toe the arch starts to rise and the leg starts to externally rotate So if you get a low score, it might be that you have a delayed windlass. Um, so you can consider things like a, a hallux or a cluffy wedge. Um, and we're going to need to reduce the tension in the medial arch structures. So we can look at functional hallux limitus modification, a two to five wedge, um, four foot valgus wedging, rear foot var um, varus wedging, medial heel skive, heel raise. So on here, again, you've got your your curvy skive and your mosai posts um, that you can try and get that uh, uh, supination force. Um, or if for instance, uh, yeah, that supination force. Um, you can remove the first met plug on your bio-advanced orthotics uh, which helps to plant to flex that first ray um, and initiate the uh, uh, increase the sagittal plane motion uh, and again for more sort of super uh, for pronated patients you've got your hemi posts or just medial wedging uh, and you can use cutouts to the first met or the first ray uh, to again help aid in in movement of that first metatarsal. Navicular drift and drop. So this allows you to assess how the foot moves in the transverse and sagittal planes as your patient's foot moves from neutral to relaxed position. So when prescribing orthotics, this test gives you an indication of which plane deserves more control. So to measure your navicular drop, so how much that uh, navicular drops from neutral to resting. So you get your patient standing and then you manipulate the foot into that neutral position. So until you can palpate the tailor head uh, sort of equally on both sides um, and you measure with a ruler where the navicular um, uh, where the prominent area on the navicular is and then you allow the patient to relax their foot and you see how much that has dropped so you can measure you can have a, a quantitative to measure um, uh, how much it, it's dropped down whereas your navicular drift again you're putting the foot into that neutral position and you can get the patient to stand on a piece of paper and you mark straight down uh, with a pencil or pen um, down onto the paper uh, where, where the navicular tuberosity is um, and then you get the patient to relax and you see how you again mark down with a pen how far um, and you measure how far it's moved uh, or drifted across. So the more drift uh, than drop the more movement in the transverse plane so you might want to consider a medial flange or a deeper heel cup to try and control um, that that movement um, whereas if you've got more drop than drift um, it's going to be more movement in the sagittal plane so you might want to consider more medial wedging or a, a Kirby skive um, or what I mean by arch profile with no addition is is that you you don't lower the arch at all you, your arch completely conforms to to that of the patient's arch 
Um, and research suggests that navicular drop may be a more valid indicator to rear foot motion than traditional frontal plane measurement so your resting calcaneal stance position and your neutral calcaneal stance position um, obviously supination and pronation are triplanar so th the more um, planes you're able to to look at the more likely you get a better overall picture so there you go that's just a, a picture of your medial flange so just an increase uh, of material around that medial portion of the orthotic uh, you can increase the heel cup height um, for your off-the-shelf orthotics uh, the buyers that have their heat moldables that's um, the, the advanced and the mechs and the unifieds uh, so you're able to try and contour that a little bit more to to the patient's arch their maximum pronation tests so here the if you just get the patient to stand in their relaxed position and then you ask them to to pronate their foot further or to try and um uh, yeah to, tr to try and pronate their foot further and you're seeing how much range of motion you've kind of got got to play with often the patient will try and move their knees at the same time so make sure that you you stop them doing that just say try and move the ankles um, only so the outcomes here are just how much range of motion do we have to play with so you might find that actually somebody that looks like they've got a relatively neutral position um, of their foot but they they actively can't pronate further so um or, or they can't supinate their foot further they've actually got a lot of stiffness in there so you trying to put an orthotic in there that's going to pronate or supinate that foot you, you may not be able to actually get that kind of movement out of the foot because the, the foot doesn't have that range of motion to to play with um, so for your more rigid foot types, you're likely to look at more of an accommodative device, but this all going to, uh, there's a lot more that comes into, obviously, you're not doing each individual test and prescribing an orthotic off one of these tests. Um, you're bringing in the, the results from all the different tests that you're doing. Um, yeah, to see what you might want to get from from that orthotic. But yeah, if you don't have so much range of motion to play with, um, you, even you putting in a, a, an aggressive wedge, uh, it's not going to get that foot to, to move um, and you might cause more problems um, elsewhere as the body tries to compensate. Four foot to rear foot relationship. So you're asking the patient to lay on the front and then palpate the head of the talus and place the foot into that neutral position and look over the heel and down the foot to see if the heel and forefoot are parallel, um, varus, uh, whether it's parallel varus or valgus relative to the heel. So you've got a bit of a difference. Well, there is a difference between a forefoot varus and a forefoot supinatus. So lots of people will say that a patient has got a fair foot, forefoot varus. Um, but it might actually be that it's just a, a, a supernatus. So what I mean by that is a forefoot varus is a fixed rigid deformity. So it's in that varus position, but you can't, with the rear foot in a neutral position, you can't actually manipulate that forefoot into, a, into that parallel position. Um, so these, uh, this bottom line here, even though the rear foot has been manipulated, um, the, the front, the toes are still on the ground. Whereas if you were to, with a, with a true forefoot varus rigid deformity, if you were to manipulate that rear foot, you wouldn't be able to get the either the lateral or the medial side to the ground. And the way that you can kind of test that is you could get the patient to to stand um, and then you manipulate the foot, the rear foot into a, a neutral position um, and see whether either their big toe um, won't touch the ground or the lateral side of their foot doesn't touch the ground. Um, and you can try and push it down as well to see, you can try and like push the big toe down to see if it uh, will touch the floor. And if it doesn't, if it's a, a rigid deformity, then that's your true forefoot varus. And it's much uh, it's much rarer than your forefoot supernatus. 
So with four foot posting, if it's a four foot varus wedge, then you might want to consider adding that medial varus posting um, because it will uh, it will bring the the ground reaction force more centrally on on that or along the four foot. Um, so that would be kind of the one of the only times that you might put a a, a four foot varus um, post. You, you're going to want to put it in a if it's a fixed rigid deformity, but if it's a supernatus, four foot supernatus, sorry, then you're not going to need, you're not likely to need a four foot wedge because the foot, the four foot will compensate anyway. Uh, and then finally, always consider the stiffness of your orthotic shell when prescribing four foot posting um, because a less stiff shell may rotate and distort around the midfoot. So four foot equinus or pseudo equinus, um, it's the the anatomical plant flexion of the four foot on the the rear foot. So if you look here at this photo, you can see that the four on the the picture on the left, uh, the the foot on the left, the four foot sits a lot lower than that rear foot. So for the patient to to get that heel to the ground, like in the the stage, uh, the foot on the right, um, it causes a dorsiflexion moment to be applied to the ankle joint as the forefoot loads during the gait cycle. So it's it causes this lock in the sagittal plane. Um, essentially, it's yeah. It, what you're looking at is that the metatarsal heads are are lower. Um, than the level of the heel. Um, so for, for the patients to get their heel to the floor, they have to use quite a bit more of their um, their talocrural joint uh, dorsiflexion just to get plantar grade, so just to get to that, that standing position. Um, so there's therefore not much left functionally when they're walking. I'm just thinking it might be easier if I... Um, Stop sharing that for a moment. So, if we look, I've tried try to get hold of a, a foot model, but uh, we're going to have to settle for a shoe. Um, so, it's not going to be a, very accurate, <laughs> but it will like, give you a little bit of an idea. So, for somebody with a um, forefoot equinus, their forefoot here is going to sit quite a bit lower than their rear foot. Um, so for them to get their heel to the floor, let's try and get this. Right. So now with the blurring. So for them to get their heel to the floor, we've got to apply a lot of pressure going down. And all the while that pressure goes down, it increases in the forefoot and it tightens up that back line. So already when their foot is flat on the floor, we're quite tight up in the posterior chain um, and we've got a lot of forefoot, forefoot pressures. Um, and then for, for the patient then to, to go forwards, um, it, yeah, you, you just, you, yeah, you've loaded up the back and you've loaded up the front of the foot. So what your, if I go back to sharing my screen, uh, there we go. So what you might see is that you've got your increase of forefoot pressure, your tightness in the posterior muscles. Um, there's also compression in the, in the midfoot joints and you might likely to see a, a, an earlier heel lift. So what we can do with uh, an orthotic is to just add a, a slight heel raise. Um, uh, and make sure that the patient is is wearing a shoe with some pitch. So for this this kind of patient, they're going to really want to avoid something pancake flat. I know it seems a bit backwards telling somebody to wear a, a slight a slight heel, um, but we're not we're not talking stilettos. We're just talking a bit of pitch, um, and to avoid things that are are pancake flat and. Uh, Lots of the time with sort of runners and things, they they have that minimal drop in the shoe. Um, if they've got a forefoot equinus, they're likely to find that quite uncomfortable. 
Um, and at the bottom there, you've got total contact with the arch. So because there are quite high pressures in the forefoot, even when they're, they're stood um, flat on the ground, if you've got an orthotic that kind of contours the, the whole of the arch, it, it does displace some of the pressures a little bit more or bring a, a little bit of the pressure from, from further away from the, the forefoot.